Well, I want to welcome you to our services for Carmichael Baptist Church. It's a blessing to be with you today and to looking forward to some time in the Word of God with you. We're going to be getting close to wrapping up this series on the miracles. We just have a couple more sermons on it, and uh, I would encourage you, if you haven't tuned into any of these messages, we probably have 15 or 16 of them on our YouTube channel, and I know they've been a blessing to me just to reflect not just on what Jesus did, but what that means for us today. Now, in this lesson, we have kind of a unique miracle. Most of the time when we think about the miracles, we're, we, we think about the Lord accomplishing something positive, healing sickness, multiplying food, calming storms, casting out a demon. But in this case, we have what we really have to call a miraculous curse. Let's look at this barren fig tree and consider it. Matthew chapter 21 and verses 18 and 19 are the two verses we're going to focus on. It says there, Now in the morning as he returned into the city, which was Jerusalem, he'd gone out into Bethany the previous night, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Now, in this situation, I think Jesus was genuinely hungry. I mean, that's part of his humanity. He got hungry just like you or I. And as he's taking that road to Jerusalem, well, this tree would seem like a pleasant surprise. It's only April. And the time of the figs, when they are harvested, is not until June. And yet it could be seen a long way off that this tree had the promise of food. The reason is because there were leaves on the tree, and the leaves do not come to a fig tree until after the fruit. But when Jesus approaches, as we read in the text, he found no figs at all, leaves only. And because of that, our Lord pronounces a terrible curse on this tree, and it withers away. Now, I think each of us had, have had times in our life, probably many times, where you get frustrated with an object. Maybe your computer quits on you, or your cell phone won't work, and, and you just you want to whack it. Maybe you even kick it in frustration. And you wonder, is that what Jesus is doing here? Is he just losing his temper? Well, that can't be the case with our Lord. He was always in perfect control of his person and of his emotions. And we can also say that he would never accomplish a miracle outside of the will of his heavenly Father. Even when he was starving there in the wilderness, he wouldn't change the stones to bread if it wasn't the Father's will. Surely he's not just going to randomly curse this tree out of anger. Now, there's a greater purpose here. What's the point? Well, it's not about the tree. The emphasis is not the tree. In his commentary, William Taylor describes this as a parable, a prophecy, and a miracle all in one. Jesus, here as he curses that fig tree, what he's doing is symbolically revealing what is going on during his ministry to the Jewish people. And in his curse, showing the great judgment that's going to come from that. Beyond that, though, this is contained in the Word of God and passed down throughout all ages to God's churches and to His people and through them to the world in our witness. Here is a message to all men that we need to take to heart. And so we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about what the cursing of the fig tree really means and then how we need to be applying that to our hearts into our lives. First thing that I want us to do, though, is to really just get the message here, the symbolic message of this tree. As I kind of relayed to you, this is a message about what's going on among the Jewish people in particular. So the tree stood for this nation. It stood really for those who have come in contact with Jesus Christ and his ministry. The leaves are symbolic for a worldly profession. Now, our Lord had certainly seen this among the Jewish people. He came to Jerusalem the day before, 
And this was right after the healing of Lazarus, or the raising up of Lazarus from the dead, which we talked about last week in a sermon. The people are astounded by this amazing miracle that our Lord accomplished there. And so they line the streets and they're crying out in praise to him, Hosanna, or save us. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And then as Jesus comes into the city, here he sees huge multitudes that are there for the Passover in obedience to God's command. He would have seen sacrifices being offered and there's teaching going on in the temple courtyard. It's all a far cry from the coldness and from the idolatry, it seems, that those Old Testament prophets encountered. These are a people that appear faithful to God and they're ready for the revival that the Messiah has come to bring. So it's a beautiful sight. There is an outward profession. And in the same sense, I think we can say there are a lot of leaves in the world today. In fact, to put it in context of the final Day of Judgment, Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 22, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Two and a half billion people, almost a third of our world's present population, associate themselves with Christianity. They claim the name of Christ. Many have stood up and proclaimed they believe in Jesus. Many have studied their Bible and learned its teachings. Many have joined a church or religious organization and they are observing the ordinances and they're following the rules as best they can. And I want to drive home to you, none of those things are bad in and of themselves. We each ought to have this testimony. We ought to be like a fig tree putting forth leaves, showing forth that... We are a Christian to the world. Others ought to look at me and see that testimony, see that profession in everything I say and everything I do. But I also want to drive this home to you. When Jesus came to that tree, he wasn't looking for leaves. He didn't want a salad for breakfast. He wanted figs. And so I want you to understand, symbolically, the figs are pointing to true spiritual life. I don't think there's a text that could better bring this out to us than Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 22. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You notice that going to church and being baptized is not on that list. Those are good things. But really, they're a byproduct of God's real miracle that takes place in our heart. When God saves you, He instills a desire to come and to worship and to serve Him. And it's not about an outward motivation. It's not about fear or some selfish desire we have. It's love. We have a love for Him in our heart. And that moves us. And then we've got a joy and we've got a peace in Him. So when those trials and hardships in this life come against us, we persevere and continue to follow Him. We've got a long-suffering and a gentle spirit towards others as we realize His wondrous grace to us. It affects how we respond to the whole world around us and how we respond to situations with goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You see, this isn't just about what you do. It's about who you are. That's really what the fruit is. Yes, it's manifest in your actions, but it flows from the heart. So when we talk about fruit, we're talking about a genuine Christ-likeness. And it's obvious not just outwardly to other individuals, but inwardly to the Lord, who truly searches your heart. Sadly, coming back to this example in Matthew Christ, as he found only leaves on those trees, he encounters hypocrisy among the Jews. The barren tree shows forth the sad picture of where the people were. Jesus looked and, yeah, he heard the praise of the people as he's coming into the city and he saw the crowds for the Passover, but he looked deeper. And what he saw were people that were there just out of some excitement, looking for a worldly miracle, people that were there in Jerusalem just kind of going through the motions of their religion, 
because they're supposed to. Religious leaders that are really teaching a form of self-righteousness and self-glory that's, no, that's every bit as much idolatry as those Old Testament people who worship Baal. Jesus came into the temple courtyard. Oh yeah, everybody's getting ready for the Passover, but he looked and he saw some money changers. And he sees some people selling animals at these high prices and they're taking advantage of the people and trying to make a profit and the priests were really the ones driving it. And he says, you made my father's house a den of thieves. And of course, ultimately what Jesus knew is that those very same people who are there lining the street crying out Hosanna to him are soon going to cry out, crucify him. Our Lord saw all this. He understood all that religion, all that adulation and excitement. It's nothing but leaves. There's no fruit. And so he pronounces on them this terrible curse. Of course, I'm, I'm bringing this out to you not to drive home necessarily how bad Israel was, how bad the Jews were. That's not what the sermon's about. This is about us. My concern is Christ's glory in my heart, in our heart, in our churches. And that's why this is recorded in Scripture and passed down to us. So I want us to take this lesson and I want us to apply it and I want us to examine our own hearts. What does this mean for us? Well, the first thing, it's a pretty simple point, but I want to drive it home to you. Christ hungers for our fruit. You know, the Lord in the grand scheme of things, is not really worried about how rich you are. He's not overly concerned if you're popular among this world or if you're successful in, at your job. Now, it's okay to pray for some of those things. It's okay to lift these things up to God, your financial needs, your physical well-being, your health, in the context of God's will, and He cares for that, and He supplies those needs, but it's all really secondary in the bigger picture of things. That's not what we're here for. Jesus makes this plain in the upper room. He's talking to his disciples in John 15, 16, and he says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. We're here on this earth for spiritual fruit. And in fact, this is brought home so well as Jesus teaches us to pray. The very first request, before any physical needs or, or burdens are brought out, here ought to be the cry of our heart. In Matthew 6, 9, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This is why God made you. It's the very purpose of your creation. He didn't make you because... Well, he was lonely. He didn't make you because he was hope, helpless on his own and needed your help. He made you because he would be glorified and honored in you. Because he's pleased to exalt his name in you. That's why he's given you your particular abilities. That's why he's put you in your particular place in life. And of course, to, to make this even clearer, if you're saved today, that's why he saved you. That's what he's telling these disciples. I chose you as my disciples, called you from your fishing boats. Why? So that you can bring forth my fruit. Christian, that's why he's delivered you from your sins. Yes, he loves you, but he would be glorified in you. And this ought to be our burden, our motivation in all we do. When all the, the money is gone, when all the things of this world, those possessions, the, the new car, the, the nice house, it's all melted with a fervent heat. You're going to care about this fruit. Oh, that it would be the burden of our heart today. Of course, I want to bring this out to you secondly. That is that Christ will inspect our fruit. Now, he, in a very real sense, he's doing this even now. And we often push this from our minds. But he's watching you. He beholds the evil and the good. So he sees what you're all, all about. But the day is quickly approaching when you are going in a very real way to come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to stand before a judgment seat. We see this in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Not symbolic. That's real. And you know, when Jesus came up to that tree, he didn't have to call Peter over here. Peter, do you see fruit? I can't, I can't tell. John, will you help me look for some fruit? He knew. There is no fruit. It was obvious to him. And so it is for, you, for your heart. He doesn't need witnesses. He's not going to hear you out. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he sees beyond just the leaves. All these people crying out, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, in thy name done many wonderful works. All that's leaves. He looks and sees what you're really all about. Now I know we're not perfect. Boy, when I read 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, I don't know about you, but that can make me uneasy. That convicts me about a lot. I've struggled. But is there some fruit in me? Will Christ find fruit in me? You need to examine this. First and foremost, have you repented of sin and trusted only in Him as your Lord and Savior? All the other good works... All the other professions, all those other leaves are meaningless without true repentance and faith in Him as your Lord and Savior. As a believer, we still need to stop and think about this. There's still a judgment. Is my life truly dedicated to His glory? Am I taking these abilities, this time, this energy, and am I using it for Him or am I wasting it on the things of this world? It's important for us not to put off those thoughts, but to consider them now, to examine ourselves now, and to seek the Lord now. When that day comes, is Jesus going to find fruit or only leaves? But of course, we can go another step further here. Christ curses those without fruit. And this tree reminds us that when Jesus curses someone or something, it's never just words. It's not just a statement. It's an action. You know, John the Baptist, right here at the beginning of, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, gave this warning to the people of Israel, to the Jews. In Luke 3, verse 8, they came there to be baptized by him, and he says, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. Every tree therefore which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And Jesus at the end of his ministry reveals the reality of that curse. He says in Matthew 21, verse 43, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And this happened. The people rejected Jesus. They cried out, crucify him, let his blood be on us and on our children. And they hung him there on the cross. And as that, accomplished, as that happened, they lost their distinction as the people of God. That gospel, Jesus had come and ministered to the Jews, but that gospel is going to primarily go out and to flourish, not among them, but among the Gentile people. And most of these Jewish people, not all of them, but a great vast majority, are given over to their false hope and to their hypocrisy. You read through the book of Acts and they become great enemies to the gospel that's spreading among the Gentile people. Of course, in 70 AD, Rome is going to come, and they're going to destroy Jerusalem, level it to the ground, and the people are going to be scattered, and that identity as a nation is, is lost at that time. But the real curse that I think Jesus is referring to here in our text is when these people who crucified the Lord when they die in their sins and they see that one that they pierced standing before them and they hear their very Messiah cry out to them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. That's a fearful thought. A horrifying thought. To, 
to be cast out into his everlasting judgment. You know, our Lord says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 14, to the scribes and Pharisees, these religious leaders, woe unto you, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. And I believe that is a true scriptural principle that there is greater condemnation on those who have greater truth. There is judgment on the idolatrous person who never heard the gospel because they formed an idol out of the things of this world and worshipped and made their own God and rejected the truth uh, of what is right that they knew in their heart. But there's a greater judgment for those who came in contact with the very Messiah and saw his miracles and attributed it to Satan. Those people who heard his gospel and yet hung him on that cross. To turn from such light to darkness. What sin? But again, it's not about them. This is about us. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans eleven twenty one, 21, or warns us as Gentile people, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. You see, we've got a lot of light right now, spiritually. Particularly in our nation of the United States. We've got freedoms to worship. We've got the full truth in our hands. We've got a gospel proclaimed. And there is a wonderful invitation that I can give you today that no matter what your sin of the past, what your failure, you can be saved and can become a child of God and have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And you know, one day, You're going to stand and give account for how you responded to that message, both today and however other many times that you heard it. And you're going to give account whether that response is real. You know, I got to thinking about it. I would guess almost all the people probably watching this, if you've kept watching particularly, you probably are putting forth leaves. You probably call yourself a Christian. You have some association with Christianity, with Jesus Christ. And again, that's not bad, but woe unto you if that's all there is. If the Lord, when you stand before him, finds only leaves, there's no greater condemnation, I'll tell you, than a hypocrite who claims the name of Christ but truly belongs to this world. But I'm going to end on a positive note, and that is this. Christ is the way to fruitfulness. Jesus So beautifully brings this out in John 15, verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. What a wonderful promise. Again, it doesn't matter what stage of life you're in, whether you're a child, whether you're 90 years old. It doesn't matter what your weakness, and as I said before, it doesn't matter what your sins of the past. You can have a meaningful, fruitful life. You can know the success and joy that Jesus Christ has created you for, and you can know this even today. But you've got to abide in Him. Abiding is not an outward profession. Abiding isn't a set of rules that you follow. Abiding isn't just associating yourself with a church. Abiding is a relationship with Jesus Christ that comes through faith. Abiding means that I'm done with my way. I'm done with my hopes in this world or trusting in my righteousness or anything that I can do. And I come to God seeking salvation from my sins and seeking peace with Him. And I come with only one hope, and that is that Jesus Christ has died for me on that cross and has risen again. And I come with faith in Him, clinging to Him. That's what abiding is. You know, a beautiful testimony of this. Just a little while later from our text, Jesus is going to be hanging on that cross. And here is a thief hanging beside him. A man who's wasted his whole life in sin. He wasn't just, there was no leaves even. He was just a barren tree. And yet in his dying moments, he looks over and he sees Jesus. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked over. 
in all his agony and all his suffering, and Jesus saw fruit. Even in that man's dying moment, despite his wasted life, he had fruit. And Jesus with joy says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. There's hope of fruit. Even to your last moments. But oh, that you would seek it today. That you would abide in Christ. Believer, this is a command and a promise that we still need to take to heart. Abiding is not something that's simply for the day of conversion. It's a way of life. Every single day we, got, we need to be seeking the Lord and making our relationship with Him the great goal of every single thing that we do. As that's our burden. As we're clinging to Him. Whether we're going to church, whether we're going out to be a witness in our workplace or leading our families or standing against the sin of this world, we're clinging to the Lord and trusting in Him and seeking our strength in Him. I can assure you, He'll make you fruitful. You might look at yourself and say, I have nothing to offer. But I can tell you, Christ has saved you for a great purpose. And while you have no strength, no ability to accomplish anything good on your own, He has all power. You abide in Him, you're attached to Him, you're going to be fruitful. He's going to do some great things through you. He's going to bring glory to His name. So let us make this our burden. I want to have the leaves. I want this profession and testimony to stand out among men, but what matters is that when all else is gone and when everything else is done, Christ will see me and He'll see fruit. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I pray it's the burden of yourself as well as me. Been a blessing to get into God's Word again with you, and I'm praying for you. Looking forward as we continue our study on the miracles again, Lord willing, next week. Stay tuned, though. Our pastor is going to be bringing a message here in just a few moments and getting into his series. Jesus is in the house. A great start to that last week. So, looking forward to that. May the Lord bless you.